Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Obstetricians and Gynecologist articles, which is an ideal resource for up-to-date, peer-reviewed information resource for your continuous professional development in women's health. Today, we are here to tell you about the Detecting Endometrial Cancer, the talk article published in July year 2021. The endometrial cancer is the fourth most common cancer in the women in the United Kingdom and the most common gynecological malignancy. In United Kingdom, there are over 9,000 new cases each year and the incidence has risen by 57% since the early 1990s. The survival rates are dependent on stage at the diagnosis ranging from 95% for stage 1 cancer to 15% for stage 4 cancer, a very important single best answer and an extended match question. Therefore, early diagnosis is essential for good outcomes. Age and obesity are the strongest risk factors for endometrioid endometrial cancer. The most common histological subtype it is. Both act through estrogen triggered endometrial proliferation, which occurs in the absence of progesterone. The estrogen is produced by adipose tissue through aromatization of adrenal androgens. After menopause, a lack of endogenous progesterone leaves the endometrium unprotected from the effect of estrogen. Remember, for the exam, what is the most common histological subtype? I repeat, endometrioid, endometrial cancer. Remember, after menopause, the chances of unprotected endometrium is more because of the progesterone lack. Thus, obesity confers a higher risk of endometrial cancer with every additional 5 kg per meter square of body mass index associated with a 50% increased risk. Around 85% of endometrial cancer is diagnosed in women older than 55 years of age, in premenopausal women, and ovulatory cycles in polycystic ovarian syndrome and obesity are major risk factors. Women with Lynch syndrome have a 25 to 60% lifetime risk of endometrial cancer and present at younger ages than women with sporadic endometrial cancer. Remember, obesity is high risk factor for endometrial cancer. Also, that endometrial cancer diagnosed in women older than 55 years of age is around 85%. Polycystic ovarian syndrome is a major risk factor as well. Also in Lynch syndrome, 25 to 60% is the lifetime risk. All these are very important exam questions. What are the risk and the protective factors for endometrial cancer? The table one of the talk article. The risk factors like increasing age, obesity and insulin resistance, the reproductive risks, the genetic risks, the lifestyle, and the iatrogenic like tamoxifen therapy as well. However, the protective factors are also obesity, insulin resistance like a healthy diet, some reproductive like parity, later age, and the last word, the oral contraceptive use as well. Also, some lifestyle factors and iatrogenic like bisphosphonate use and the metformin as well. The 2015 National Institute for Health and Care Excellence, the NICE guidelines, suspected the cancer guidance recommends that women with postmenopausal bleed are heavy, irregular bleeding who are over 45 years, I repeat, who are over 45 years of age should have a full history, pelvic and speculum examination and urine analysis performed in the primary care. Those with persistent unscheduled bleeding for more than six months after starting the HRT should be referred for investigation. And those with new onset postmenopausal bleeding should only be referred if bleeding continues six weeks after stopping the HRT, a very important exam question. The causes of the postmenopausal bleeding can be malignant, it can be pre-malignant, it can be benign, it can be iatrogenic. Also, two-week wait referral for women aged equal or more than 55 with postmenopausal bleeding. Consider a two-week wait referral for women aged less than 55 with postmenopausal bleeding 
consider a direct access TVS in women aged 55 or more with unexplained vaginal discharge who present for the first time or who have thrombocytosis or report hematuria or there's a visible hematuria with low hemoglobin levels, thrombocytosis or high blood glucose level. Please do not forget box one and box two of the talk article. A very important question can be formulated from this part. Endometrial cancer should be considered in premenopausal women with abnormal bleeding, particularly those with obesity, polycystic ovarian syndrome, a strong family history, or other risk factors. A systematic review of premenopausal women with abnormal uterine bleeding found the risk of endometrial cancer or its precursor lesion. The atypical hyperplasia was just 1.31%, with intermenstrual bleeding being a better predictor than heavy menstrual bleed. The risk of premenopausal women increases with BMI and is reportedly five times higher at a BMI of 30 or more kilogram per meter square. The most effective diagnostic strategy for the investigation of postmenopausal bleeding remains controversial. There is no evidence-based up-to-date guidance from NICE, the Scottish Intercollegiate Guidelines Network Design, or the Royal College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, the RCOG. The British Gynecological Cancer Society, BGCS, recommends TVS as first-line investigation of postmenopausal bleeding, followed by endometrial biopsy with or without hysteroscopy if thickening of the endometrium is found. I repeat, TVS as first line, followed by endometrial biopsy with or without hysteroscopy, a very important exam question. One-stop clinics in which patients are scanned, reviewed by a clinician, and offered endometrial biopsy and or hysteroscopy in a single visit reduce the delays, improve the patient experience, and are cost-effective as well. The transvaginal sonography for investigation of postmenopausal bleeding, the diagnostic accuracy of TVS for endometrial cancer detection depends on the endometrial thickness cut off used. The BGCS guidelines currently recommend endometrial thickness of equal or more than 4 mm. I repeat, equal or more than 4 mm. A cutoff of equal and more than 4 mm had a sensitivity of 94.8% and a specificity of 46.7%. This is the most important diagnostic pathway for women presenting with postmenopausal bleeding, and it is updated. The two week wait referral with unexplained postmenopausal bleeding, the first step is transvaginal scan. If at all, the endometrial thickness is less than 4 mm, examination including the speculum, no biopsy is required. We reassure the patient in the extended match question and discharge. However, if endometrial thickness is equal or more than 4 mm, but not irregular, the endometrial biopsy would be done. If at all, it's inadequate sample. If low risk of endometrial cancer and TV is not concerning, we can decide for reassure and discharge in the EMQ. However, if at all it's inadequate sample and she's high risk for endometrial cancer, or we have some concerns with the transvaginal scan, we would diagnose the endometrial cancer with further investigations. If it's a normal result, that's fine. We can discharge the patient. If in the exam scenario, they give you endometrial thickness equal or more than four millimeter, along with that, it is irregularities or polyp seam. In this case, we will not select endometrial biopsy alone. Please remember, we would be selecting the outpatient hysteroscopy with endometrial biopsy. Hysteroscopy in this case would be must to be selected. Do not forget that this algorithm, this is updated and the 4 mm and more than 4 mm is the cutoff of endometrial thickness from this talk article. Recommendations. An incidental finding of a thickened endometrium in an asymptomatic postmenopausal woman is a thorny issue because there is no consensus as to what endometrial thickness cutoff requires further investigation. 
the UK collaborative trial of ovarian cancer screening, UKCTOCS, reported asymptomatic endometrial pathology in 125 of 36861 postmenopausal women within 12 months of TBS and found a cutoff of endometrial thickness of equal and more than 5 mm and had a sensitivity of 77.1 and specificity of 85.8% for the detection of endometrial cancer. While easy and quick to perform in an outpatient setting of endometrial biopsy is an invasive procedure with potential for harm, including the failure 11%, inadequate sample 31%, pain, bleeding, infection, and very rarely the perforation. The numerous aspirating brush and cannulation devices are available that show similar diagnostic accuracy to traditional dilatation and curettage but enable outpatient sampling. Failed endometrial sampling is usually associated with pain or cervical stenosis, which are more common in nulliparous women. The diagnostic accuracy of investigations for endometrial cancer detection, the table two of the talk article. What does the TOG article tell us about hysteroscopy? Friends, the TOG article says that the hysteroscopy is direct visualization of the uterine cavity via a fine bore scope to identify the pathology, take directed biopsies, and carry out therapeutic procedures such as polypectomy. Hysteroscopy is indicated for women with a thickened irregular endometrium or other concerning features on ultrasound. Those with recurrent or prolonged bleeding or where random endometrial sampling has been non-diagnostic. All these indications of hysteroscopy are very important, both for the extended match question and the single best answer. When it's offered as part of one-stop clinic, this is the most cost-effective and efficient way of investigating unexplained postmenopausal bleed. This is how the transvaginal sonography images of endometrial cancer are, the figure two of the talk article. The diagnostic models as per the talk article. The current approaches to the investigations of postmenopausal bleed do not take risk factors into account, yet certain groups of women have a much higher pretest probability of endometrial cancer than others. Predictors used in these models are age, age of menopause, the BMI, the parity, the recurrent postmenopausal bleed, hypertension, diabetes, hormone replacement therapy, warfarin use, endometrial thickness, detailed ultrasonographic sonographic findings, and serum HE4 levels. All these predictors are very important for the exam question. These models are not currently used in clinical practice because none have been externally validated and their clinical efficacy has not yet been established. The aim of screening is to identify occult atypical hyperplasia or endometrial cancer in asymptomatic women. There is currently no established endometrial cancer screening program in the UK, neither for average risk nor high risk populations. In average risk postmenopausal women, TVS has the advantage of being tried and tested, but the endometrial thickness cutoff chosen is a trade off between sensitivity and specificity. Ensuring cases are not missed might expose large numbers of women to unnecessary invasive diagnostic tests. Current BGCS guidelines recommend that the women with Lynch syndrome are offered annual TVS, hysteroscopy, and endometrial biopsy after the age of 35 years. This is very important exam question. I repeat, annual TVS, hysteroscopy, and endometrial biopsy after the age of 35 years. Other high-risk groups include women with class 3 obesity referred for the weight loss management in whom a high prevalence of occult endometrial abnormalities has been described in breast cancer survivors receiving tamoxifen treatment, although no screening strategy is currently recommended for either group. The Novell Endometrial Cancer Detection Tools under the development, the sampling methods, the biomarkers, the advantages and disadvantages. Please have a look. No single test is sufficient to both rule in and rule out the disease in women presenting with red flag symptoms or to identify the occult endometrial cancer in asymptomatic women with risk factors. Uterine samples, including endometrial brushings and a uterine lavage fluid, 
are an excellent source of cancer specific biomarkers, but their collection is invasive and poorly tolerated by some. The anatomical continuity between the upper and the lower genital tracts provides the opportunity for naturally shed tumor debris to pass through the cervix, enabling collection from the vagina using tampons. Urine is the perfect biofluid for non-invasive sampling because it is easy to collect with the potential for large volumes, repeat samples or collection at pre-specified times of the day. It depends on urinary excretion of systemic cancer biomarkers or the reliable contamination of urinary flow with uterine shed tumor debris. Circulating tumor cells, circulating tumor DNA, and microRNA are genomic biomarkers that could facilitate diagnosis, treatment monitoring, and the detection of relapse, but their low concentration in early stage cancer limits their applicability to current detection limits. These are the sampling methods for novel detection tools, the endometrial levagin brushings, the cervical brush sample, the vaginal tampon, the vaginal swab, urine sample, and the blood sample. To conclude, friends, this talk article says that used in combination with validated diagnostic models, these tools could enable fast-tracked invasive diagnostic for those at greatest risk, while avoiding the physical and psychological harms of investigating healthy women. Such a tool may also be useful for screening asymptomatic women who are deemed to be high risk by virtue of age, obesity, or hereditary predisposition, where currently no standardized program exists. Despite its reputation for good prognosis, the rapidly rising incidence and devastating outcomes from advanced disease means that 40% more women are now dying from endometrial cancer than they did at the turn of 21st century. Early diagnosis is key to improving outcomes, and there is much interest in the development of minimally invasive detection tools for the rapid triage of symptomatic women. Some important talk points from this article are, how common is the endometrial cancer? Also, we need to know the referral pathway. The diagnostic pathway is very important and updated in this talk article, and the treatment algorithm is a must question for your exam. Best of luck from the entire team of RFA tutors. I thank you all for joining us today. See you next time. And until we meet again, take very good care of yourself. Bye-bye.